I really believe that like each of us is this unique biochemical form and is a unique biochemical form through which energy can flow through. And like, there's all these different ways to like create in the world, but a book is one that it's like, it's just eminently scalable, transferable, movable. And so that just feels really, really good. I think there's, again, there's like so many ways to create art and to take what's inside of you and put it outside of you to share. But that particular thing of doing that, taking what's inside of you and, and putting it outside of you to hopefully spread light in the world is an incredible feeling that I kind of want everyone to be able to feel. And in a way to slow down enough and set boundaries in their life enough that they can do that process. Welcome, Casey. Mike, it's so good to see you. Feels a little strange to welcome you since I came to your town to do this, and you're more familiar with the studio, and you sometimes host this show. <laughs> so this is really more of a chat between colleagues than a uh, than a host situation. I've been so looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it might be useful just to set up initially why I'm talking to you and to note, to sort of signpost for anybody listening to this, that this is part one of a two-part series on the Good Energy book. We're going to do an episode with you and Rob Lustig in a couple of weeks, which will be questions from members, Rob and you chatting more about the content of the book. And what we're going to do today is talk more about the process of writing the book. And the reason I jumped on this is because I'm the editorial director, I'm the sort of writer in, in residence at Levels, the journalist, and uh, you hired me three and a half years ago uh, to basically do this. So uh, this feels like a, a very natural, I don't want to say bookend to our relationship, but it feels like a natural milestone in our relationship. It does. And I feel like you've been a part of really every step of this process. So it's pretty cool to be chatting about it now that it's actually done. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I thought because we're not going to dive too much into the book and because we're planning to release this the day the book comes out. Um, so most people listening to this, at least initially, will not have yet read the book. Why don't we just start with a description of what the book is? Give us the kind of overview of what Good Energy is. Mm. So Good Energy is, I think, really a reimagination of what the future of health for America can look like. It is a call to action for both individuals and the system to really examine how our system is broken right now. Patients are getting sicker every year. The more we spend on healthcare, the sicker we're getting. It's not working. And... The thing is, though, we have every reason to be really optimistic because we know the answers and we really just need to build a system that actually focuses on bringing those to fruition. So we know that metabolic dysfunction is the root cause of almost every chronic disease and symptom we're facing in the United States. That is clear from the research. However, we're not practicing medicine in a way that actually approaches metabolic health. But we know that. We know the science. We also have incredible tools and technology now that can give people access to real-time metabolic health information, like what we're doing at Levels. Plus, there's so many amazing direct-to-consumer companies that are giving people much more empowerment over their biomarkers and health. And so this is really such an exciting time in human history to live our healthiest and longest lives possible. But we do need to shift the arrow of how we're practicing medicine right now to usher in what could be a really bright future if we keep going down the path that we are right now with the current approach of conventional Western healthcare? There's literally no amount of money that we could spend that would create healthier Americans. And so this book is really three things it's a deep unpacking of the broken system from both my time inside the system as a surgeon and entrepreneur in this space. Uh, it's also my personal story losing my mother to metabolic disease and. Um, as a physician, and then just an ultra practical, actionable guide to understanding and improving your own metabolic health in a way that is, you know, very holistic, but also very joyful. So I think it's, there's been a lot of rigidity and deep optimization in the, the conversation about proactive health over the past few years. And I think what I really wanted to bring to this was a real sense of awe and joy to that conversation and really just empower people about what the subtitle says, creating limitless health on every level. It really does feel like a reflection of uh, your point of view. Like it is such a distillation of all of the things that we've worked on the past several years trying to get this message out in the world through levels of the relationship between metabolic health and X condition, right? The practical what you can do with it. But where this felt 
unique to me, even being as familiar as I am with the material, right, having kind of lived in this space the last few years, is how much your POV comes through, how much it is a Casey take on this stuff and that that vibe and that optimism and that sort of enthusiasm, uh, I feel like really came through, um, which maybe is a good place to transition to the, the genesis of this idea. As I mentioned, you know, since I met you, because you had started the content operation at, at Levels, you've been a writer for a long time. The Casey book has always felt like an inevitability. It just felt like there's going to be a time, of course there is, where Casey's going to do Casey in book form. I'm curious if you felt that way at any point along this journey um, that you felt this starting to brew uh, and how it it went from whatever it started as to being, when did this become a real idea? When mm. did it look like, yeah, we're going to do a book? Yeah, yeah. So I have wanted to write a book since I was a child. It's always been something I've wanted to do because books have been one of the things that have impacted me and my thinking more than anything else in the world. You know, reading growing up, high school, college, there are these books that have been signposts in my life for helping direct me in the direction, you know, that I ultimately became the next phase of my journey at every step. And so I, I understand the power of books. My dad's written about five books. My mom was an English major. Writing's always been a part of our lives. And so I actually had this post-it, um, on my computer for years, like sort of at the bottom of my monitor, that was a really short poem from this wonderful poet, Rupi Kaur, um, K-A-U-R. But it says, my heart woke me crying last night. How can I help? I begged. My heart said, write the book. And so there's always been this feeling of like, write the book is going to come to fruition. And I think where it became something that had to really like burst out of me was, I think after a year or two of levels, you know, I'd had my experience as a surgery resident really being so disillusioned by the healthcare system. Then we started the company and then we started interacting with like tens of thousands of members who I think we're so hungry for a different way to understand their health. And then my mom passed away. So it was this confluence of really like understanding that there's such a need and a hunger through our members and also interactions I was having, I think, on social media and just sort of really seeing how much of a craving there was for answers, seeing just the devastating cost of ignoring the warning signs of metabolic disease and then seeing how broken the system was. At a certain point, that sort of like the poem came to fruition for me of like I was woken you know, in the middle of the night, so to speak. And it's like, it's time to write this book because this isn't out there. Like this particular flavor of answer blending technology and how to use this modern technology we have plus metabolic framework, plus sort of systems inside behind the curtain. And, and it became very clear. So it was less of a conscious thing than it's like this had to come out. It had to come out of me, you know, or I kind of was going to explode. Ultimately, though, how it practically came to fruition was after some of the first big podcasts we did for Levels, literally after the first Mark Hyman episode aired that I did on behalf of Levels, agents started reaching out to me. They said, you know, hey, we saw your episode, um, just wanted to see if you have representation. And so that was sort of where it, it was. I was having these feelings and then that started happening and it was like, OK, maybe the time is now and sort of started talking to Josh and Sam about that. But once that happened, I had a call with that agent and sort of learning about like, what is this? What is an agent? What does an agent do? What does an agent need from me? And then when it became sort of a reality that this was going to happen, I went on a much bigger journey to really start understanding the space and this was in August 2021 um, and really and so I can talk more about that journey as well. If you've heard me talk on other podcasts before, you know that I believe that tracking your glucose and optimizing your metabolic health is really the ultimate life hack. We know that cravings and mood instability and energy levels and weight are all tied to our blood sugar levels. And of course, all the downstream chronic diseases that are related to blood sugar are things that we can really greatly improve our chances of avoiding if we keep our blood sugar in a healthy and stable level throughout our lifetime. So I've been using CGM now on and off for the past four years since we started Levels, and I have learned so much about my diet and my health. I've learned the simple swaps that keep my blood sugar stable, like 
flax crackers instead of wheat based crackers. I've learned which fruits work best for my blood sugar. Like I do really well with pears and apples and oranges and berries, but grapes seem to spike my blood sugar off the chart. I'm also a notorious night owl and I've really learned with using levels how if I get to bed at a reasonable hour and get good quality sleep, my blood sugar levels are so much better. And that has been so motivating for me on my health journey. It's also been helpful for me um, in terms of keeping my weight at a stable level uh, much more effortlessly than it has been in the past. So you can sign up for levels at levels.link slash health, get access to a continuous glucose monitor and the level software that helps you really uh, dial into a lot of these strategies for your life and your body. Yeah, I'd love to dive more into that just sort of nitty gritty of, okay, you've talked to agents, you know folks who have written books through our advisors and, and some other people, so you have some familiarity with that world, but from agent to publisher to signing a deal, just walk me through the specifics of what, how long that took, what did you learn along the way, uh, and what were you surprised about? What were lessons learned there? Yeah. So from that first email I got from an agent, that cold outreach, which was August 2021, to signing a deal, which was about July 2022. So that was about, you know, a little under a year, basically. And so what happened was once I started starting to shape the understanding of what an agent does, then I did reach out to about 10 people in my personal network, many of our advisors, and basically just asked like, hey, can I speak with you for 20 minutes to understand just a little bit more about the book writing process and finding an agent and about your experience with an agent? So I had all those meetings and people were so kind to talk to me and give me some input about what to look for and, and whatnot and make some introductions. Um, I took notes on all of those, of course, in the levels way. I created a database and had Notion documents for everything, but really it was like a listening tour. Like, let me learn about this industry. Uh, from there, I then did have meetings with several of those agents, and it's essentially a conversation of pitching your idea. And at that point, I had like a very basic rudimentary proposal, uh, just some typed pages about, you know, what I was looking to, to bring into the world with this book and then get some feedback from them. And so that was, you know, eight to 10 meetings in the winter of 2021. And then ultimately, you know, found someone that I really clicked with and who just really so believed in the vision um, of the book. And after a few conversations, made the decision to, to work together. And I ultimately um, had the opportunity to work with Richard Pine, who's an incredible nonfiction literary agent, uh, who's Mark Hyman's agent. And um, he's done some really incredible books in the space. Um, Angela Duckworth, uh, Arna Huffington, um, uh, Andrew Wheel. So it has a, a great nonfiction, basically transformational nonfiction, and then some really amazing health books as well. Um, and then essentially the next, so that was December, and then December to the summer was basically working together with him and my brother to create the proposal, which is like a huge, huge process that I think um, is very valuable because you're really refining the concept. But the proposal is basically like a 60 to 80 page Word document that is an overview of the book, a marketing plan, a real presentation of the differentiation, but also the comps in the space, and then a couple sample chapters. And so that's what you're going to share with the publishing houses to actually really pitch the book. So that was a much lengthier process than I expected because you really want to create something that just like with a pitch deck or something, like you're going to, you know, really be trying to create a vision of how this book is both going to be different and how you're going to bring it to market. And so then summer was when the agent goes and shares this with the different publishing houses and shares the proposal. And if they're interested, they'll set up meetings with you. And then you do a literal one hour verbal pitch with the different publishing houses over the course of about a week. So it's sort of like a VC fundraise. And then there is a literal day when they all um, basically put in offers if they want to put an offer in to basically represent and acquire this book. And the agent sets that date and 
And that's when there's more of that determination of who's going to be the publisher. So you get presented with different offers and things like that. So that was over the course of about, you know, nine, 10 months. And then by summer 2022, that's when we ultimately um, went with, you know, Penguin Random House and this incredible imprint there, Avery, um, which we just were so aligned with on an ideologic perspective. Uh, they're bringing in really like optimistic, practical nonfiction to help create a better world. Um, you know, they've done the Book of Joy, Brene Brown, um, so many amazing health books, Terry Walls, Fiber Fueled by Dr. B. Um, and then you get a deadline, which was May 1st of the following year. So between, you know, partnering with Penguin and May 1st, that's when the book actually gets written. Wow. So when you were looking for a publisher, so you, you sort of go from this germ of an idea, you work with the agent to really flesh it out and then go do these publisher meetings. Were the publisher meetings more you pitching them or them pitching you? Or was it more of a conversation to kind of make sure you were aligned and wanting to go the same way? And how much were they responding to the pitch versus, um, you know, presenting their vision for what a Casey book might be sort of taking off of your pitch? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's very much a conversation where you're trying to find out if this is the right fit. They've certainly read the whole proposal and obviously responded enough to want to meet with you. And they get a lot of proposals, I think, where they don't schedule a meeting. And so there's definitely interest, but there's always something different than the page and actually the author sharing like the spirit behind what it is. And so I think that's your opportunity as an author to really share the energy and the personality and the spirit behind what's on the page because they're going to be working with you definitely for years just to bring that one book to fruition and then potentially longer and so um you know I think at the end of the day like when an author is writing a book like they are bringing something into the world that they believe like just has to exist and so just like really sharing that fire and that energy and then on the, the sort of business side of it it's like you you know, if you're, if you're being represented by a, you know, one of the top publishing houses, like you, you, a big part of it is like really wanting to be able to see, like, are you going to be able to be the messenger to, to bring this book in a big way into the world? Like, we're not looking for like a little outcome here. And so like, is it the right fit in terms of, do they believe that you're going to be the messenger and the advocate who can push this book as far and wide into the world? That's my perception of, of part of what that meeting is, is to really like share that, sense of intensity and seriousness of what of, of you wanting to bring this into the world and as you know from you know working with me it's like metabolic health is what I live and breathe and it's it's my my dream for the world is that we can focus our healthcare system and our choices around this and so you know I just really brought that passion um and then of course learning a little about their team and you know what what that relationship is going to look like so um so that's kind of how the conversations go yeah, in, in my experience. So now that you've been through this process at least once, if somebody were to call you in the same position you were in two years ago, having conversations with, with Rob or with Mark Hyman, what would you tell somebody now? Oh my gosh. I would tell them to absolutely do it. Like this has been one of my favorite, I mean, it's been like probably the one of the best experiences of my whole life. You know, I would say like, if you feel that you need to write a book, like I, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I think working with, I only have one experience, which is my own, which is working with an agent and working with a publisher. Like I didn't choose to self-publish, you know, I chose to work with a team. And I think that's been incredible because especially as a first time author, like having people to really help show you the way who have tons of experience, um, is incredibly valuable. Um, and legitimizing, I think, um, to have like that kind of, you know, representation, but just really find people who you really, who really connect with the topic and like that it's also meaningful for them to bring this topic into the world. Like both my publisher and the team and my agent deeply care about this issue. And that of course is very important to me because alignment is so critically important to me in all aspects of my life. So really finding people that want to also bring this mission into the world and believe it's going to really help things. Well, let's talk about the actual writing of the book then. Uh, so you get a deadline, you've got a deal, you 
obviously started to tackle some of it in in the pitch. And I, I think you'd shared with me a very early version of the pitch. So I'm just curious, maybe as a place to start, how did the idea and the focus evolve from really throughout the process from maybe starting to put that pitch together and writing a table of contents and a couple of sample chapters to what it ultimately became? I would say the core thesis of the book did not change very much throughout the process. My brother's my co-author were quite clear on the core, core message. I think what did change a bit throughout the process was some of the framing. I think that like one interesting anecdote is that in the very beginning of writing, we sort of had a bit more of a title that was, I would say, like skewed negative. So initially we were going to call the book Save Yourself. And ultimately now it's called Good Energy, which I'm so happy about that. But that was actually a long conversation with our agent who was like, you know, there's just different energies that you can bring to a title. One that's a bit more like focusing on the negative and one that's really drawing people more towards the promise and the opportunity and that people can move towards rather than be like moving away from save yourself has a bit of like a more scary, you know, I think a lot of what the, in terms of framing evolving over time, it's, it's just always about putting the reader first, you know, like this is about mission and impact. So like how can everything be framed in a way that can really serve the reader the best? Um, so that was something that really evolved and then I think just incorporating as much storytelling as possible. For me, as someone who's been very much in the academic world and who like is just obsessed with like everything being so like highly referenced and mechanisms being explained in detail, which, you know, we work together. So, you know, this like it's like that is good. What is the purpose of the book? The book isn't necessarily to be the most comprehensive metabolic health textbook that's ever been written that shows that we, you know, are clear on every single pathway. It, it's to actually help people live a better life. And so how do you do that? You, you know, I think you do that through metaphor, through storytelling, um, actually through simplicity in a lot of ways. And so that was actually a tough journey for me in a way, being like the scientific academic person. I had a lot of post-its around my desk while I was writing, but like, one of them was really about like, it's always reminding me of the mission and really putting the reader first. Like this is not about me. It's about taking this message and, and making it as impactful as possible. So, so sometimes that actually includes cutting some of the parts that you might scientifically find so interesting to unpack, but might not actually be the thing that inspires someone to truly understand the concept. I'm curious about that journey of including so much personal anecdote, both from your time as a surgeon, uh, going through your mother's passing, experiences you've had along the way. It's very engaging. It's, it does help it be impactful. It very much doesn't feel like a textbook because every chapter opens with, at least opens with, and in some cases there's a lot more of it, some kind of personal anecdote. Was that something that you knew you were going to do from the beginning or did, and, and how did you calibrate how personal to go, what details to share. Some of it is is pretty, I don't want to say raw, but it's very honest. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like people are going to get to know you through this and they're going to know more about you than has probably been out in the world before, even as much as you've done in terms of podcasting. What was that journey like deciding to share as much of yourself as you are? Some, a lot of the stories got cut down, you know, in terms of the process, like I wrote this with my brother and the book is in my voice. But one of the ways that we started was actually my brother reading a many hundred page document that I had written when I was a resident. And so of all stories from my time as a resident. And so something I did when I was a surgical resident and it was just an overwhelming tidal wave of experiences that I was having in the operating room and people dying and just, it was one of the only outlets I had to get all that emotion out of me was when I was driving home pretty much every day from my, you know, 36 hour shifts or whatever, I would voice dictate into my phone, like stories from the day. And I don't know what compelled me to do that but I think it's something spiritual was just basically telling me, like, put this on paper. And then it just sat for years in a Google Doc, hundreds of stories. My brother ultimately went through that document, which was a very vulnerable experience to, like, you know, have my brother basically reading my journal from residency. 
but pulling out stories and essentially attaching them to like, what are the points we're trying to make for people to really understand the system? Where are the stories from my experience that kind of match whatever thesis we're trying to get through in a particular chapter? So I would say 95% of the stories that in my head, I'm like, well, this is so important to share. They just did not get included. So a lot of what ended up making it to the book was like, what from my personal experience and life and challenges and, and what I saw can help bring alive the underlying points and, and theses that we believe is, are so important to get into the zeitgeist and really kind of matching those experiences with what we're trying to bring in. And so what was nice about having a co-author is that I'm so attached to every story because it's like, and in, in a sense, I initially was like, I kind of want this to be more of a memoir, but that's not what needed to be written, you know? So it's having an impartial observer basically say like, this is not going to help. This is not going to help. This is not going to help. But this story will help make this point. That was so helpful because it just, I was too attached to some of it. So yeah. So I think having a third party or, you know, a second party in terms of my brother was so valuable in that regard um, of being a little ruthless about what to include and what not. So yeah. When did you decide to bring Callie into the process? Was that always something you were going to do or would where where did that idea come up and, and how did that evolve? What did that look like? Yeah, it really came to fruition right after my mom died. So in terms of the timeline, she died in January of 2021. And then that was in such an interesting time. And it's just so funny. Hindsight's 2020, right? Looking at your life. And it's like all of this just happening, unfolding in such an interesting way. My brother had just sold his company which was a custom wedding dress company he had with my sister-in-law that they started just out of business school. They had just sold their company to David's Bridal and he was really figuring out like the next sort of thing he was bringing into the world. And after my mom passed away from basically the end result of 40 years of missed warning signs of metabolic disease and my brother interacting so deeply with the healthcare system and just seeing so up close and personal, a lot of the things I'd been talking about theoretically, you know, for years, he became, I think, incredibly evangelized about how broken our system is. And it, it really helped him tie together some things that he'd actually seen earlier in his career. He had been a consultant for food and pharma and in his own way, seen inside the system, how broken it is from the side of consulting and PR in the food and pharma industry. And then that paired with this personal experience with my mom and seeing how the healthcare system, that they're all kind of playing from the same playbook, which is basically like, unfortunately, this devil's bargain of make people sick and addicted to food and then profit off their illness and then kind of be silent while all these underlying issues develop tell everyone that they're separate things and send them to a million specialists. And then the lethal diagnosis comes and all of a sudden everyone swoops in to kind of get their piece of that. And so my mom, you know, developed cancer and, you know, only at that moment did the whole healthcare system essentially activate. And, um, and I think he was just really astounded by like, where were all these people for 40 years as she was racking up the comorbidities that ultimately led to cancer so there was sort of this perfect storm of timing where he was really becoming so passionate about this mission and evangelized in his own right. I was starting to think about, you know, with all the work we were doing at Levels, this sort of opportunity to put it together into something cohesive. And then, and then things kind of came out of the woodwork to bring it all together. I felt that I couldn't write this book alone because obviously we were doing so much at Levels and things were crazy. And so having a partner in that who I both you know, fully trusted with my personal stories and who was evangelized in the same way that I was through the loss of a parent that was preventable. I think it was just absolutely a perfect thing. So it kind of came about really organically. And um, the book wouldn't have, I think, ever come to fruition without us doing it together because I would have probably gotten hung up on my own, you know, busyness and even limiting beliefs and all sorts of stuff. And to have his fierceness and power to push things along was absolutely critical. So, and then of course his perspective. So. And how did it practically work with you two working together? How did you share the writing? Man, I mean, it's really just been, I would say like daily 
texting, emailing, calling. Like we've basically just been in constant communication for the past two years to bring this to fruition. We're both not the most organized people in the world. Like we're both like pretty vision people. And so it's been kind of like grinding it out, you know, like, and really like just staying in very, very close touch. One thing that was wonderful is that we, we both really, I think, benefit off hard deadlines. So we created a lot of deadlines for ourselves, just internal deadlines for like certain parts of the proposal and, you know, finishing the proposal. And then once we were writing the book, like different chapters, like we are going to have these chapters done by this date, having that accountability and internal deadlines is critical for us. And then a lot of it was like, where do we feel like inspiration is flowing in each of us? So if I was really feeling like, okay, the next few weeks, I am going to focus on chapter five, six, the food chapters. Like he's going to really work on chapter, like the systems issue chapters. And then we'll basically like get something down and trade and spend a couple weeks basically working on each other's. It was a lot of that. So kind of like taking lead and then passing off. And, you know, ultimately a hundred versions later, we have the final product, but yeah, it, for us, it was very fluid. I would say, um, of just constant communication and, uh, a lot of internal deadlines and just, yeah, sharing things back and forth and being a set of eyes on each other's work constantly. I know you guys were, were close before, but I have to imagine this brought you closer. Or was there a point in the book writing process where you guys were like, you know what? I need a month away from you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a pretty wild process to go on with a sibling, like to bring a book about your mother into the world um, and a book that's in my voice, which has been so interesting. And it's definitely been a growth experience for both of us. I think anytime you work with someone closely, like at a company or anywhere, like it can be such a great forge to kind of like, you know, birth the next version of yourself. If you choose to look at it as a growth experience, like we did some therapy together while doing the book, you know, cause it's like, we're working together all the time. It's pretty high pressure. We both had other jobs. You know, I had a full-time job with levels. He also started a company true med while we were writing the book. So just making sure our communication was as productive as possible. Like we even got some like outside help with that, which was amazing. Um, and I just have so much respect for him for being the type of person who wants to like always try and cultivate the best possible communication. So I think the beauty of the project, was, though, was that it was always a way to, you know, both honor my mother and her, you know, her journey and which unfortunately ended prematurely. But like because that was a centerpiece of our work, I think that helped both of us continually rise to the occasion um, of bringing our best selves because, you know, we want to, of course, make her proud and and honor her memory and her, you know, her sacrifices. And I think when you're working on something that's really mission focused, it, it really helps cut out a lot of the noise. You mentioned the voice and we talked in the beginning about how much of your voice comes through this. And I was reminded of, you know, you and I worked for a while on a newsletter that you did. Um, and I remember a lot of that was about, you know, not just the topics, but what is the voice? What is, what is the Casey perspective uniquely to this? Talk about the evolution of, of the voice or how you landed on the voice, or you could even say the sort of persona of, of Casey, the author of Good Energy, and that you know, going from maybe that sort of more negative perspective, not necessarily negative perspective, but maybe more cautionary perspective and really embracing that kind of positivity and good energy vibe, and then doing that with a co-author. Well, I have to give so many like kudos to my brother, you know, because he he always wanted the book to be in my voice, you know, and always was clear about this, even though he did, you know, as much or more work than me, like on this book, the thing that my brother was relentless about was that this is about the reader. This is about impact. So what is going to be the most valuable for the reader? Like having a book from two perspectives, you know, that's a little confusing, like, but having the book and the message coming out through my voice as a young female physician um, who'd had these experiences firsthand in the healthcare system, like ultimately we believe that that was going to be the voice that could have the impact that we wanted. And so because his focus is so, it's so egoless, it's so focused on mission, impact, and reader um, clarity, 
he actually in many ways pushed for it to be like this needs to be in your voice and it needs to be very clear that this book is from you which like I really honor in him what was important to him was like basically that impact um and then in terms of the how do we get aligned with like what the voice is going to be like how do we put Casey on paper I mean, I have to turn this, give you a ton of kudos on this because I think when we were working together at Levels, one of the early things we did was create like a brand voice document for Levels. We also created a brand voice document for me. I would really highly recommend any author or writer or content creator of any time to take the time to sit down and write a brand voice document because it clarifies what is what is your style when it when you translate it from personality to paper. And I actually brought ours because I was like, this is kind of fun to go back and look. And it still rings true for me. But like, this was what was in our document for me and which I've shared with so many people that I've worked with since then, which is like, we use proper terminology. We use sophisticated language. We're not overly conversational or use slang. We like don't want to patronize the reader. We explain mechanisms in detail. We lean in and provide the details of studies, including numbers. We don't just, you know, hand wave evoke a sense of awe at the science concept where appropriate, because that's a huge part of me, and be very direct about the problem and don't sugarcoat the truth. And then always keeping my goals in mind, which is that I want people to be out of the doctor's office. I want to empower people to control their own health where they can. Um, I want to offer evidence-based real talk. And I live in total awe of food, cooking, nature, soil, the human body and mind, and I'm very passionate. So it's like, I look at those and we probably originally wrote those years ago, but it's like, it's exactly how I, you know, am and solidifying those on paper. Like my executive assistant has those, my head of operations has those, you know, in, in, in sort of the, the business that I have now for the book and it just gets them on the same page, you know? And so I think that's really valuable for people to do as an exercise, honestly, like kind of anyone that wasn't something necessarily that Callie used when we were writing the book because I think he knows me well enough to just understand my voice, but it it it's very helpful to create clarity around how you're going to show up on on paper. So, have you do you have one for yourself at all for your writing or have I, you done that? I don't for me, but it was an important thing at levels in the beginning. And I remember when I started and you know, you and I talked a lot in those early days with pre-hiring and then once I started about that what the voice should be. And, and in the first content memo, it was something I really focused on is like, what is this? Because there's a lot of different ways to convey this information, right? Yeah. Like there's, you know, there's a very magazine-y, snappy, sort of service-driven, can almost get to snarky, kind of slangy way of doing it. There's a much more academic, you know, sort of way of doing it that's not conversational at all. And then there's that, which I think the book really balances well you mentioned the sort of don't sugarcoat it, be honest. And there's there's definitely a lot of very bracing information in the book about the system or about the dangers of some of the stuff, but suffused with a real empowerment. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that's a word you and I talked about a lot and we still try to think a lot about in the content we do of, you can't just scare people. It's gotta, it's gotta move to a place of empowerment and you can do something about all of this. And I thought the book really nailed that and I remember that's something that we talked about a lot of of it it's the awe I think helps provide a a kind of joy to it um and that was the other thing that came through I was thinking about this this morning we were having a conversation internally about um members and how they eat and and this sort of balance between trying to really you know eat for your stable glucose versus not and somebody referenced like well you know people like to be healthy for a while and then they like to have fun and, and my sort of hair stood up because I thought if Casey were part of this conversation, she would say there is not a distinction there. Like you can eat healthy and have fun. <laughs> like we should not be saying it's either like eat well or like be happy. And particularly in the context of this book, I was thinking about it because the book in no way, you know, it doesn't feel like preachy. It doesn't feel like homework. It feels like, right, we can embrace the joy of feeling good, being alive, having great health while eating healthy and sort of doing all these things. So I, I felt like this really did nail your brand voice, all of that that we came up with. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, it's um, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that 
part of writing also helps you develop that voice. I think as you're writing, like when you really put something on paper that you feel like is like the perfect representation of you, like you can feel it inside when it's sort of like not exactly quite on the money. Like it feels, you don't feel as good about it. So I think like being really present with the like book at every stage and reading every chapter. I mean, I probably read every chapter like a hundred times at this point. I'm like, is this me? Is this me? Or is this anyone else? Like who, and it's, you know, recorded the audiobook, and I'm like, at the end, I'm just like, this is just me. This is me on the page. And so there's a lot of body awareness, I think, that goes into, you know, writing a book that feels authentically you and just always checking in, like, does this, is this me? Or is there, is there something else that, you know, that I'm writing, you know, that's coming in here that doesn't quite feel right. And I think, there's such a process of then going out and evangelizing your book. That's like, of course, like after you finish the book, then you get into like marketing. And so being able to feel really like it is exactly what you want to say is, is so important. And I think exercise is like reflecting on your brand voice and who you really are and how you want to show up in the world can just be like a really useful thing. So I would just certainly recommend that that is just like a process for anyone who's a creator create that document for yourself. And how about the actual process of writing? So a lot of this, you were, as you said, you and Callie, both full-time jobs, Callie starting a company, such a massive undertaking. This is not a, it's not a tiny book. It's not an unreported book. I want to talk more about the reporting because there's a ton of, of it in here. Just walk me through your sort of schedule, your practical tips for actually sitting down and doing the work. Did you struggle with procrastination? You mentioned deadlines were important, but how did you actually get yourself to write this and and did it change at all over the course of writing it? Yeah. It so the process was really interesting. Um and cha- it's very challenging. It was very challenging <laughs> like to to find the time and motivation and everything to just sit down and actually get this done. I love deadlines. I'm glad we actually had a tight deadline July to May basically, because it just, you know, it meant it it just had to get done. So the way I approached it was I initially hired a ghostwriter, like a person who would, or a writing partner, you know, and I talked again, I went on kind of a listening tour to people who had worked with collaborators because you'll see on a lot of books like Peter Tia's book says with Bill Gifford and David Perlmutter's books say with Kristen Loberg and so I reached out to a lot of people who had used collaborators and talked to them about their experiences and said hey can I spend 20 minutes picking your brain about using a writing partner and then just like with the agents interviewed with a bunch of different people and read their writing samples and tried to get their vibe and then ultimately I signed a contract with someone who I you know was going to work with for the book. And the reason I did that, which is of course a really big financial investment and everything is that I had so much writing and podcasts and just so much material that I thought, you know, could kind of be fleshed into, um, the book. Cause we had such a detailed 80 page outline basically with the proposal, um, and was working with like levels full time. And so that was like, oh, this will be great. Like, you know, and it was a very valuable process to work for a couple months with a writing partner. Ultimately though, I think because it's my first book and it is so personal to me, my mother, my story, my history of being like incredibly depressed in residency and all of it, I quickly realized that I just had to write this book myself, me and Callie. And so we ended up, you know, not working with the writing partner. We worked, you know, for a couple months with them. And then it just became super clear to me that like, I I just needed to take, you know, to do this. And so that was a great process because I learned something. So then I realized that I needed more dedicated time to just do this. So that's when I, in early 2023, took a few months off of work and I just took a sabbatical and that was totally necessary for me to do to finish the book. And I sat in the middle of the winter in my little home in Bend, Oregon. And I sat at my desk every single day for like 13 hours a day and spent a lot of that time staring at the wall and a lot of that time writing. And like, it was literally, there were like three feet of snow outside most days. And I just had this, like the most yin, antisocial internal period of my life, just like writing basically. And that's a, that's, you know, I mean, it can be, it's a very strange process. And I kind of felt like the crazy writer for those three months, like some days never getting out of my pajamas and, um, you know, some days writing one sentence, some days writing 
30 pages. So that was fascinating. So, but what I did during that time, um, you know, prior to that, it had just been kind of trying to cobble it into weekends and evenings. And I, you know, like it was just tough, but that was nice to have that dedicated time, kind of a writing retreat, basically. Um, I used focus mate a lot, which is an incredible program where basically you're just paired with someone on zoom. Um, and you are with them for an hour and you spend three minutes telling them what you want to accomplish in that hour. And then you check in at the end and basically talk about, so it's, it's literally just like being essentially having some external accountability to your one hour work chunk. And so I'd schedule sometimes eight of those a day, just like back to back. I love focus mate. Um, and a lot of the book got written basically like with a person on the screen in Dubai or China who was also on. So that was pretty cool. I love focus mate. Um, the other thing I did that was very motivating was every morning as I was brushing my teeth and taking a morning walk, I would listen to a book or a podcast about writing to kind of get me motivated. So I listened to the war of art, which is a great book, um, about writing. I listened to, uh, big magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I listened to the writer's way. Um, I listened to creative act by Rick Rubin, tried to find a lot of other podcasts. So like I'd start every day with just a writer in my ear talking to me about the writing process and something about that just like helped me stay motivated. Similar to like when I need to get back on certain health kicks, I'll listen to a book about that. Like if I'm slacking on lifting weights, I'll go back and listen to like Gabrielle Lyons's book, you know, forever strong, like something about that really gets me motivated. So starting every day with just like a little chunk of inspiration and then lots of deadlines. Yeah. Just like you know, telling Callie and my publisher, I will have chapter seven to you by this date and telling everyone to disappointing people is one of my like strongest motivators. So forcing myself to set those deadlines. So those were the, some of the things I did. And then, yeah, just keeping a really quiet life at that time. It was a lot of walks, um, you know, a lot of just really sitting and thinking. And I think another thing, that I just honored in myself and, you know, really tried to like step out of any shame around it was that like, it's not a linear process. It's not like you just sit down and write every day all the time. Like there's a lot of churning and birthing that has to happen and that's okay. Stuff is still happening in that maybe downtime that looks like you're not making progress. I was so fortunate in my family growing up. My, like I mentioned, my dad has written several books and my parents both have always supported this notion of like, there is so much magic happening in the background processing. And so like, you don't want to overschedule your life. You don't, we did so much stuff as a family. We traveled, we were always doing cool stuff, but they were not afraid of unstructured downtime because they're both really deep thinkers. And so you know, there'd be times in medical school or other times when I call my dad or mom and be like, I just feel like such a lazy piece of shit. Like I've been staring at the wall for the past two hours and I feel totally unmotivated to do anything. And they're like, yeah, you're thinking like you're, you've had all these experiences the past two weeks and you're consolidating and thinking about them. And I remember my dad gave me this book by called the agony and the ecstasy, which is a biographical novel of Michelangelo. And he gave it to me in college. And I remember loving this book so much, but a lot of it is about Michelangelo, we think of as like one of the most prolific artists in history, but he spent like, there were like decade periods where he basically like had nothing produced or like didn't wor work like, but he was thinking and he was synthesizing, he was living life. And so I think in the writing process, there can be a lot of this internal dialogue about like, I didn't get enough done today or like, this is not working, but it's like just totally stepping out of the like giving yourself a hard time and respecting the fact that there is so much churning inside of you. And if you've written 20 pages a day before, you might just be like processing what was written and, and then your trust that there's going to be like an explosion the next day or the day after. So kind of just like really honoring the cycle as opposed to beating yourself up about it, you know, cause that, that doesn't really help as well. So, yeah. I just, just this weekend, I listened to Cal Newport's new book, which is called Slow Productivity, and it opens with the scene of John McPhee laying on his picnic table, staring at the sky for weeks as he's trying to figure out what to do with a 40,000 word, you know, one of his many 40,000 word pieces that he was going to do. Um, so that, that Michelangelo story very much rings true in that way. Did that 
come naturally to you that that being able to balance between sort of bursts of actually I'm sitting down, I'm typing, I'm doing the work of putting words on paper with I just need to think for a while. Did that sort of organically arise in the particularly in that three month period of really focusing on the writing? Or did you have to did you come to that after sort of burning out from writing or did did somebody sort of give you that advice? I think a lot of it came from the family experience, from like what my family valued. Um, and this throughout my entire life, hearing this voice from the people I respected most, my parents, that to be maximally creatively generative and to create new independent thought, it like requires periods of yin. You know, it like requires not being constantly busy. And so like that was very much built into me. Like I remember um, I would see my dad when he was writing, like he did a lot of thinking, like he's a, you know, a big thinker and then would like write an entire book in like two months, you know, just like at the dining room table over the weekends. And it's like, that's both part of the process, you know? So it wasn't so much, there are probably other writers who are different, like who like they just have, you know, the four hours every morning that they sit and they type the entire time. But I'm a bit more of, I think that like I need, I do need discipline and I need the deadlines, but I also need just a lot of time to like synthesize and think that's always been a part of my life. And I think it's why sometimes if I'm overly social or I'm overly busy, I will very much get deeply depleted. Like I need the quiet time. Um, and I think something interesting about our culture right now is like, I just think there's like this cult of busyness. We're just our capitalistic, crazy digital culture. Like it's just all about like how booked can you be? Kids are so booked now. Like everyone's moving all the time. And I just wonder what that's doing to our ability to like just sit and synthesize complex thoughts. And then you couple that with the cancel culture, which is like, okay, if you speak your complex thoughts, we're going to cancel you, you know, like, so there's on both ends, there's a stifling of, you know, I think creativity and sharing. It's like, keep you as busy as possible and feel like you have less value if you're not constantly doing stuff. And like that, just stopping and thinking is like, you're lazy. And then when you do share your thoughts, if we don't like it, we're going to cancel it. And so you get this really like, unfortunately, like a stifling of, I think, what is the ultimate gift of being human, being this particular species in this incarnation, which is that we have these crazy complex supercomputer brains. And so some of me, to get back to your question, I think some of what really motivated me was just like, really believing that and like being like me taking the time to think and synthesize is almost an act of revolution in our culture and something I want to fight back against in our culture of over busyness and of, of essentially different ways to get people to maybe not be fully expressing their unique flavor of light in the world, which I think is one of the biggest epidemics we have in our culture today is like, you know, is that is like a, a stifling of, of kind of our unique voice. And so there was a part of me that also everything I do, I think I get really motivated by a little bit of like a resistance contrarian edge. And I think being like, yeah, I'm going to do me and I'm going to sit in my house and bend for three months and putter and walk and think and write, you know, and let spirit flow through me in that way, like felt really good because it's different than what society wants from us right now, which is, and I got off social media completely, totally got rid of all my social media accounts during that time. And it like almost feels good to be like, yeah, I'm going to live this sort of different life that isn't necessarily like normal, but I think this is good for, you know, to live in that way of pure creativity for a little while. So that motivated me too. It's interesting listening to slow productivity at the same time as I was reading your book over this past week. And as Cal Newport's talking about what you were just talking about, this sort of appearance of busyness, and we have to be constantly running, even if we're not getting things done. I kept thinking about what is this doing to our mitochondria? <laughs> that, that sort of constant, um, you know, we know what a role stress plays. And I just had that thought of like, right, as a sort of culture, we are, stress is so in, it built into the culture now, right? If you're not stressed, you're not, you're not doing it right. And mm -hmm. 
Like, no wonder our mitochondria are suffering if that's the default. Was there a health journey for you through this? How did you sort of maintain your health and your practices in that period, particularly of sort of, um, you know, really deep focus on the book? Yeah, I mean, I think during that time, I actually needed to get extra support, I think, to stay accountable to the health stuff, because this was such a big thing. And there was such a big deadline that it was like everything else could come second. And as I think you know about me, like I'm a night owl. And that is also kind of an issue for me. And a lot of my creativity comes at night. So but it was not healthy for me to be like staying up till four in the morning and then sleeping until noon. It was okay. And, but like, and actually my therapist at the time was like, who cares if that's when you're writing the book, like just do it. But I actually knew it wasn't feeling healthy for me to be like staying up so late. So I hired an amazing coach, this amazing woman, Monica Nelson, who was with me during this entire period who helped me on sleep coaching, nutrition coaching, and was my personal trainer over zoom. So for the entire time we had three zoom workouts scheduled per week, which I did in my garage. And, um, we did resistance training and high intensity armor training. I took walks constantly. Cause that's really when I think she and I, uh, she had me keep all my food logs and made sure I was getting enough protein and all that stuff. And we reviewed the food logs every weekend of the whole process. And she made me send her my sleep data every single night. And we had a goal of me basically going to bed before midnight and getting seven, eight hours of sleep a night. And then I did work my, with my therapist during that time. So like, I just called in the forces. Cause like, I, I just, you know, I have no pride when it comes to like, Oh, I have to do this all by myself. Like I, I definitely believe in having support. And so I had my remote team of amazing women who were basically helping me like stay as healthy as possible during the process. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Those were, those were the main things. That's such a great message because I think it'd be so easy for somebody to read this book and think, Casey's got it all dialed in. Casey's always eating perfectly. Casey's always sleeping perfectly. And, you know, when we used to do the newsletter, you were always honest about, nope, I go on vacation and I struggle to maintain this. But just that notion of getting help and like whether it's a coach or whether it's a friend or a you know, your sibling or somebody else that just helps sort of, yeah, sometimes you're just going to need that support to maintain it, particularly in a burst of intense work, totally. right? like in, in this kind of period where you do have those, those deadlines, you need to get things done. I sort of think of the writing of a book in sort of three parts. There's the, there's the thinking, there's the writing, but then there's also the reporting. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear a little bit about that aspect of it. You know, on one hand, this is stuff you've been living and breathing for so long, but there is so much in here of the science, of the explanation of the mechanisms, of the latest research. Just what did the reporting process look like here? What did you have to do to to make sure you were as up to date as you needed to be on the science. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours just on PubMed while writing this book. And, um, I think for me, absorbing so much over the past 10, 15 years, you know, cause this book is really like a culmination of everything in my life that I've been learning there are things in this book from that I learned in college, that I learned in medical school, residency, my own reading, philosophy that I've read, my experience losing 70 pounds as a 14-year-old. Like it's all in this book. And so a lot of it was like basically – and I think that the, the framework that I present in the book was – like fully sort of fleshed out in my mind based on just the thousands upon thousands of little data points from papers I've read and this and that. And then a lot of it is like, then how do you take that framework and both like validate it and make sure that it's like right <laughs> and then flush it out with enough additional data to really make it like rock solid. So like the rough architecture was basically like, that was just the product of the bubbling up of the thousands of experience of my life and all those nights thinking and journaling and all that stuff. And then the book process was about like deeply verifying that it was correct and flushing it out so that it would, would be really rock solid. And so that was kind of going to the literature and just, just reading paper after paper after paper and then picking the ones for the book that actually like really helped, you know, bring it all together. But it was fun. You know, I've always been a journaler and, um, take copious written notes and like 
what's fun is that the book has like little pieces from, I probably have 20, 30 journals, you know, it has little pieces from every single one. Like I remember going to a conference like 10 years ago and re- re- learning about thylakoids, which are like a molecule in chloroplasts and plants that like, um, have an interaction with like the distal small intestine in the gut and actually like promote satiety. And so like eating green vegetables along with other foods will actually promote satiety just through the mechanism of like the thylakoid that's part of the chloroplast. And like that just fascinated me at that time and was written in some journal and it's in the book, you know, but I, of course then had to like go back and read 20 papers about thylakoids and really understand what it meant and like, and just solidify it. So it was, that was kind of the process. And then there were new things I learned for the book for sure. Like surprising things like, um, you know, another example is like, I remember I read this great book several years ago called whole person integrative eating. And they talked about gratitude. If people with type two diabetes express gratitude before a meal, they have a lower glucose response to the meal. And so that had been stuck in my brain somewhere, you know, in some little filing cabinet. And when I went to go really dive into that to include it in the book and really truly understand the research behind it, I found like lots more about how the how of eating is actually almost equally important as the what of eating. So like eating with other people, eating slowly. I learned that the people, if you look at certain, there's certain studies that show that people who eat the fastest, like, so the fa- the fastest quartile of eaters have like a four times higher risk of metabolic syndrome than people who eat slower. So like fleshing out, there might've been a nugget or a pearl in my mind. And then as I went down that rabbit hole, learned new things that I wanted to include in the book. So that's kind of, that's kind of how it took shape for me. And then just ultimately having a, you know, my computer just was just PDFs of just hundreds or thousands of papers basically that I was constantly, you know, shuffling around on my computer and, it was, yeah, pretty amazing process to like have this opportunity to continue my education in a way and flush out concepts that had interest me throughout my life. Was there anything that you either changed your mind about or maybe changed your emphasis on? Oh man, that's a really great question. You know, I mean, I think something that evolved from the start of Levels to the book is that I was vegan when we started Levels and now I'm very much not vegan. I'm very much focused on sustainable agriculture and food sourcing. And so I think that that was definitely, you know, the first seeds of writing the book were when I was actually had a different eating philosophy and basically through research and through understanding and growing, really realizing that it's, I think a lot more about food quality and the nutrients and the sort of the molecular information of our food than like a particular dietary strategy, like just eliminating meat. So that was one that I feel like just got continued to be fleshed out as I wrote the book of like really understanding and trusting my approach. I think something that evolved for me a lot throughout writing the book is I think writing the book actually made me a much more spiritual person. A lot of the books I was talking about and reading about like big, big magic and the war of art and even the writer's way and the creative act, actually, they all talk about how like writing is like, if you're spiritually inclined to think that that, that way, like it's a bit of like part of the work is actually just like slowing down and letting yourself hear the signals that are kind of need to come through you. There's like a great, story in Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, where basically like her and Ann Patchett, two of the most prolific writers in the modern world, they both had the exact same idea for like the same novel that was like very specific about like a botanist going to South America, like within a few weeks of each other. And one of them had the capacity to take that idea and write a book. And like one didn't at that time. So like something happening in the other realm that's sort of like looking for people you know, on earth to basically take that idea and push it forward. And like, as I read a lot of these writers talking about that and let myself kind of be open to that, I think there was a bit more of like hearing signals of like, you need to go in this direction or you need to keep writing about this. And then as that kind of kept, I kept flexing that muscle of like, kind of almost asking for like help, like help me. Like I want to hear these signals. I believe in these signals and then feeling kind of more of that come through. I think that, and so that actually, I think then did make it into the, it did make it into the book where there is a bit, 
of a spiritual element to the book as well, um, which I'm really excited that that came through. And to kind of wrap that into metabolism, I think, and you were talking about like, how does all this stress affect our mitochondria? Like one thing that really came to me in writing this book is that like insulin resistance, which we're talking about on a very mechanistic level inside the book, it's like insulin resistance is fundamentally a block of the flow of energy through our body. Like our cells are so overwhelmed and confused by our modern world that energy, potential energy from the environment is blocked to move through us into human energy. It's a block of flow. And so just like really sitting with those concepts and like the bigger picture of what that means. Like if food is actually like the sun's energy stored in the carbon carbon bonds of plants, which is what it is, which is pretty freaking cool. And our bodies are fundamentally like one way to look at the body is it's a transformer of energy from potential energy outside of us from the sun to human energy, which lets us think, feel, move, create ideas. Insulin resistance is literally the block to that flow. So yeah. So I think like the book was, I think, even more sciencey, like when I started the project and almost became even more spiritual as I got so deep into the project, because like, you know, we're all here at levels to like save the mitochondria and the book, like the idea is to save the mitochondria, but like on a bigger level, like we're unlocking the capacity of the body to do what it's really meant to do, which is have an unbridled flow of cosmic energy, solar energy through us to power, hopefully our highest purpose. And like that inspires me like so deeply, like even more almost than like talking about food. And so that was an evolution for me too, I think of just like more, just even getting even more in a state of awe of what's really happening inside our bodies and hopefully bringing that to the pages. You mentioned this as a kind of culmination of a lot of the life experience, the learning you've done over the past 15 years, how does it feel now we're looking at the actual physical product of it to have all of that sort of encapsulated in one book and kind of just all together and out there in the world? Does it feel like a milestone, a sort of chapter in your life? Does it feel scary to have it kind of all put into a permanent record in a way? Oh my gosh. I think it's, it's the best feeling. I think I've like one of the best feelings I've ever had. Like um, this is why I really would encourage people to like take the leap if they feel like a book is bursting out of them to do it because it's a, it, yeah, it's a process of crystallizing, you know, what's inside of you into something that can live outside of you, um, hopefully forever and have a positive impact. And it's a way to scale. Like we've always talked about this at level. It's like time does not scale. Content does scale. So it's hopefully a way to like scale your light. You know, and I really believe that like each of us is this unique biochemical form and is a unique biochemical form through which energy can flow through. And like there's all these different ways to like create in the world. But a book is one that it's like it's just eminently scalable, transferable, movable. And so that just feels really, really good. I think there's again, there's like so many ways to create art and to take what's inside of you and put it outside of you to share. But that particular thing of doing that, taking what's inside of you and, and putting it outside of you to hopefully spread light in the world is an incredible feeling that I kind of want everyone to be able to feel. And, and in a way to slow down enough and set boundaries in their life enough that they can do that process because it feels really freaking good. I think it's why all of us probably write. It feels amazing on that level. I think that's what is in the book if internalized can change lives, can help people be incredibly empowered, can help them reevaluate their relationship with all systems that we hand over our trust to without maybe thinking as deeply as we should about that relationship, um, to have awe and reverence for their own bodies. Um, and I just really, yeah, I just really believe that everyone can benefit from supporting their metabolic health. And, and so it just feels really good to, to have that in the world. And like my greatest hope is that it helps improve people's lives, you know, like we're all trying to do at levels and, you know, so yeah, I would say it's the representation of an unbridled flow of energy through me. And that I think is ultimately like one of the best feelings you can have as a human. You're a writer. So I want to like actually turn this question back to you. How does it, does that resonate with you? Like as a writer, like 
when you like see an article, I don't know, like curious your perspective on that process. It's interesting. I, having not written a book and as a journalist, probably less so because I think the focus is less personal and more, well, it still has to, anything I do has to sort of feel authentic to me. Yeah. I couldn't write something that I disagreed with. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, for me, it's more about, am I, uh, making this information as clear as possible? Yes. Am I telling a story that's going to sort of pull somebody in? Um, but I'm curious about the, I mean, you mentioned earlier that idea of the voice having to feel very much like you. And it sounds like your experience of, of actually finishing this and it's starting to be out in the world, um, that, that that feeling that this is an authentic representation of you has maintained. And that feels like it would be so key, right? To If you get to this point and feel like you had, for whatever reason, sort of been railroaded into doing something that you didn't fully believe in or didn't feel that authentic, uh, would be very difficult because especially at this stage when you're out, you know, having to promote it and, and talk about it. I mean, I think about, you know, you watch actors go out and promote a movie and you're like, oh, they didn't like that movie very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could just sort of tell and they're like, yeah, it was great. You know? Yeah. I, I know we're talking before this is fully released, but some folks, I'm sure you've had, you know, friends, colleagues, people you trust read drafts of it. Um, from the little bit it's been out in the world so far, what's been your experience of just sharing the book itself with other people, any feedback that you've gotten, anything you've heard so far? Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, you know, I would say probably only about like 25 people have in the world have read it, like all the reviewers and you and my publisher. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, the feedback has been, has been wonderful. I mean, the, the final product of, about of the book is the result of literally dozens if not a hundred like drafts. So it has been critiqued and evaluated and changed and had feedback at every single step. So I think like once we get to the final product, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I think that, you know, you're in a place where probably more of the feedback is positive because the people who have read it have been involved in the critiquing process throughout. So it's like now it's finally that final product. I think it's going to be interesting when the book goes out into the world because I'm sure then there's going to be a lot more like a huge diversity of feedback. And I expect that and I welcome it because it's, you know, it's not a soft perspective. It's like a very strong point of view. It's a very intense critique of the largest industry in the entire United States, um, the healthcare system. And it also, it is very direct and no punches pulled about what needs to happen for us to be healthy. This is not a book about all good things in moderation, you know? And so there's def, I'm sure there's going to be pushback from a lot of different sources and I welcome it because this is about starting a conversation to push our country forward, our world forward in a positive way. And, I don't think you're ever going to be able to do that without some elbows being thrown. And so um, that's going to be a fascinating experience that I think I'm, you know, just every day continuing to just, you know, build my mental and physical fortitude to sort of, you know, just really be ready for that. Because it's like, yeah, it's crazy that there's, it's been a multi-year process and it's still not even in the world yet. And so, but I, I definitely welcome all of that. And um you know, I, I like so many people have said this before me, but it's like if you're if you're kind of in the arena putting yourself out there, you know, there's going to be criticism and whatnot. And so hopefully the, the goal would be that that, that sparks conversations with people. So yeah. but we shall see yeah. <laughs> if it's not starting conversations, then I'll be disappointed. I think it definitely will, because as you say, it, it certainly takes a point of view. And I think it to me, it really crystallized a lot of what we've talked about over the years of those moments when your real passion around a subject or like, no, this is just what needs to happen, um, comes out. And I feel like that comes out throughout the book. Again, it all sort of, um, ensconced in an optimistic, positive science backed sort of voice, but it, it definitely does not pull punches. So I'm sure you will have conversations around it, um, which like I said, will be great. And I, and I, you know, it'll be interesting to see, if there is feedback 
how you feel about it six months or a year from now, right? If there are feedback or there are conversations you have that I don't imagine the, the changing your mind about the thesis of it at all, but just, you know, you will continue to grow as a thinker in this right. space, right? And and I'm sure your points of view on a lot of this stuff will continue to evolve yeah. and and which actually kind of leads to my last question. So I'm so glad to hear this was such a positive experience for you. Is there another book in you? Ooh, I mean, I would love to write another book. I would love to do this process several times. And I think at this point I'm, yeah, just my intention, the focus right now is just getting the book launched, but I'm, I have the intention out there in my meditations of like, kind of, again, asking the universe, the, you know, spirit world, like, I would like to write another book. I'm so grateful for this process and I'm ready and open to seeing the signals that are put in front of me for what's next. So just like, that's really kind of like my prayer every morning is like, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things on my mind for sure of like what I'd like to explore next. Um, and, but, but like, there's not that exact thesis that I think was, you know, that I had for this. And so right now it's mostly an intention of like, I am willing to see, recognize and not ignore signals that come towards me. Sort of like that Anne Patch at Elizabeth Gilbert thing where like this idea kind of floated to both of them and who was ready to take it. So kind of just putting that intention out of like, I am ready to hear and will respect the signals that are put in front of me, which I think is, you know, the, the, the I love there's like, um, this kind of saying within the, um, there's this like wonderful, like Hindu sort of thinker Yogananda and like one of the sayings from that, that sort of like teaching meditation practices, like you have to make the first move with God, you know? And so like, that's kind of my first move of like, you know, I'm ready to hear those signals and I would love to write another book. So that's where I'm at <laughs> right now in terms of the second book very early. Yeah. Is there anything we, we didn't touch on that you want to share about this process or the experience of, of writing it, or even if there are any other sort of practical tips, tools, anything like that, that we didn't hit on? You know, I think one thing that I think was a big surprise, to, not a surprise, but like that is feels so real now that I just couldn't have known three years ago is like how big of a team it takes to bring a book to the world. Like there are so many people and, and writing the acknowledgement section, I think is such a beautiful process because it just makes you realize like it's, it's dozens and dozens of people that allow this to come into the world. And I almost like can tear up just with like gratitude thinking about, yeah, all the people who have had to be involved to just have this book be on the table. Like from, of course, there's like 10 people in my publishing team. There's, you know, the, the people at the agency, um, there's of course my brother, my, you know, dad and friends, like the whole levels team who is so supportive and you and copywriters working with recipe developers, working with designers, working with Sonia, my incredible, you know, partner in bringing this book to the world on the marketing front, the past eight months, my executive assistant, like it's just, it is literally a village of people without whom, if with any one of them not there, like it really wouldn't exist. So, um, a lot of writing a book I would say is like, um, you know, just like team management and, and project management. Like, ve like there is the creative part of writing the book and the practical part of writing a book, but a, it is a huge organizational endeavor, like where there are a thousand moving parts. And that's why, you know, I'm working with Sonia, who's really managing the book launch. Um, and you know, she's the most efficient person I've ever met and is working full time with me for almost a year. And like, I just can't even imagine doing all that stuff on my own. And then we also have Callie and like, so it's just, I think that's just something to realize that like, it is a, it is not just writing the book, writing a book. It is also bringing it to the world, which is a very dynamic process. Um, you know, and, and as the author, you are responsible for marketing the book. Um, you know, making sure that you're a representing it as aggressively as you possibly can and finding ways to get this into the zeitgeist. So that's podcasts, media, press, network, et cetera. So just like kind of managing that communication strategy is a multiple full-time job. If you're doing like a a big book with a, with a publisher. So that's just, it's really fun. And I really enjoy that, but it is like a whole other, 
you know, it's a whole other business. So, you know, you have to, you know, start a business literally like an LLC, like it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, but so that's just something to be aware of. And that whole process is really fun, but it takes a village and there's a lot of being an author. That's also being like a, a project manager, a team manager, kind of running a slightly like separate business for the book. So I don't think, you know, and I, that's been learning on the, on the go. And I think talking to other people who have done this before you as much as possible, isn't one of the best ways to learn kind of like how to do it. So, yeah. It feels like that, that is also probably a useful culmination of everything you've done over the last 10 to 15 years, besides the actual contents of the book is just the working practices you picked up at levels and before the people that you've met, you know, Sonia, obviously working with her at, at levels and just assembling this team around you of folks that you can operationalize all the podcasts and, and sort of practice you've got at doing it, that is sort of the perfect moment in your life to be in this position to now be out selling the book as opposed to say 10 years ago. Totally. Tot I don't think I could have done it 10 years ago. Absolutely. I mean, and just like thinking about how like the process of writing this book and bringing it to the world and then levels cultural stuff that we've developed over the years, like they're completely intertangled. Like this has been a very asynchronous remote process of bringing, you know, everyone we've worked with has had to deal with our loom videos and notion documents. And so it's so fun to see the intermingling of our culture at levels with like this also culture I've sort of built in this book publishing, you know, part of my world and just seeing the, the beautiful fingerprints of them kind of all, you know, all over each other. I've worked with of course, Jen Chesek on copy editing the book, who's someone I met through Levels. And, um, you know, our advisors have been an amazing resource. So it's just been a beautiful interconnected process um, and feels like it only could have happened, yeah, at this kind of moment in in life. So, yeah, but I, I definitely, hopefully none of this conversation intimidated anyone from writing a book. It is such a beautiful learning experience and process. And I think if that, that sort of sense of it needing to come out of you is real, like honor, you know, really don't, don't shy away from it. It's a beautiful process. Mm -hmm.